Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Romans achieved what seemed impossible, a massive dome that defied gravity and engineering logic. The Pantheon's dome remains the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. It has withstood earthquakes, storms, and centuries of human activity without collapsing. How did they build it without modern tools? How does it still stand while other ancient structures have crumbled? At its heart lies a series of groundbreaking techniques, from carefully layered concrete to hidden chambers in the walls and a mysterious oculus that both lightens and strengthens the structure. But even the most precise calculations couldn't prevent cracks and sagging during construction, forcing its builders to innovate on the fly. Could this ancient wonder have secrets still undiscovered? Let's find out. The story begins in the heart of ancient Rome, during the reign of Emperor Augustus. The original Pantheon wasn't the Grand Dome we see today, but a different structure entirely, commissioned by Marcus Agrippa, Augustus's right-hand man. Agrippa, an accomplished general and trusted advisor, envisioned a temple that would immortalize the gods and Rome's growing supremacy. Inscribed across the facade of the current Pantheon, the words M. Agrippa, L. F. Cos, Tertium Fecit, Marcus Agrippa, son of Lucius, made this during his third consulate, remain a testament to his role in its inception. However, Agrippa's Pantheon didn't survive the test of time. A devastating fire during Emperor Trajan's reign reduced it to ashes, leaving behind only fragments of its history. From the ruins of Agrippa's original structure rose the iconic pantheon we know today. This reconstruction was initiated under Emperor Hadrian, a ruler known for his ambitious building projects and fascination with architecture. While Hadrian rebuilt it, he chose to honor Agrippa by leaving his name on the new structure, an unusual gesture in an era when emperors often erase their predecessors' legacies. Interestingly, there's debate about the pantheon's purpose. Was it merely a temple to all Roman gods, as its name implies? Scholars think not. Textual clues suggest the building served as a multi-purpose space, a sacred venue where emperors were venerated alongside deities and, at times, a hall for public audiences or important imperial proclamations. Imagine standing in a space where the divine and political converged, where gods and emperors shared equal footing. What sets the Pantheon apart isn't just its purpose, but its groundbreaking design. Step inside, and you're immediately struck by its grandeur. The circular rotunda, capped by a massive dome, is a masterpiece of symmetry. Its interior height and diameter are perfectly equal, 150 Roman feet each. But this wasn't just about mathematics. The space itself evokes awe. The floor's checkerboard pattern mirrors the coffered dome overhead creating a sense of cosmic harmony. At the very center, the oculus, a massive open circle in the dome, lets in light and connects the heavens with the earth below. Standing beneath it feels like standing at the axis of the universe. So, how did the Romans achieve this marvel? The answer lies in their revolutionary use of concrete. Unlike modern concrete, Roman concrete was laid almost dry in thin layers over an aggregate foundation. The mix contained volcanic ash, which not only made it incredibly durable, but also allowed it to strengthen over time, even under water. For the Pantheon, this innovation was key to constructing its massive walls and dome. Roman builders used a clever technique, layering fist-sized stones and concrete in alternating sections. The walls weren't solid throughout. Instead, they contained hidden chambers and recesses to release heat and allow air to circulate as the concrete set. This method sped up the curing process while reducing the overall weight, a necessity for such a massive structure. The identity of the Pantheon's architect is another mystery. Some credit Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius behind Trajan's Forum and other grand projects. While there's no definitive proof, similarities in style and technique suggest he might have been involved, or at least heavily influenced its design. Construction was a team effort. Experienced contractors oversaw the project, leading skilled craftsmen and a rotating crew of day laborers. Interestingly, most workers were free men, not slaves, a contrast to the massive labor forces used for other Roman landmarks like the Colosseum. Around 200 to 300 men worked on the Pantheon at any given time, a relatively modest number for such an ambitious endeavor. Beneath the Pantheon lies its true strength, its foundation. 
The rotunda's base was a concrete ring over seven meters wide, likely just as deep, though its full depth remains unknown. This solid footing supported the massive weight of the structure above. The walls themselves were 6.2 meters thick, faced with bricks that resembled large tiles. These bricks, called bipedales, two foot square, and sesquipedales, one and a half foot square, were often cut into triangles to lock securely into the concrete behind them. Intermittent bonding courses of bricks helped unify the wall structure, distributing weight evenly. But the walls weren't uniform. Deep recesses and niches punctuated the interior, serving both aesthetic and practical purposes. These spaces lightened the wall's load and provided room for air circulation, which was critical as the concrete cured. Even with meticulous planning, the Pantheon's construction didn't go perfectly. As the rotunda rose, the immense weight caused parts of the structure to settle unevenly. The floor still sags near the edges, a half a meter dip that whispers of ancient challenges. Cracks as wide as seven centimeters formed in some sections of the walls, posing a serious risk to stability. To counter these issues, builders reinforced the structure with additional buttresses. The Basilica of Neptune, a neighboring structure, was repurposed to help brace the Pantheon, ensuring it could bear the strain before the dome was added. The crowning achievement of the Pantheon is its dome, the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world, even today. Constructing it required more than just innovation. It demanded precision and daring. Builders used lighter materials toward the top, gradually reducing the dome's weight. The coffered design, with its hollow panels, wasn't just decorative. It reduced the overall mass while maintaining strength. At its apex, the oculus is both a structural and symbolic feature. This massive open circle at the dome's crown serves a dual purpose. It lightens the weight at the dome's most vulnerable point, while allowing sunlight to pour into the space below. The result? A mesmerizing play of light and shadow that shifts throughout the day. Standing under the oculus, you can't help but feel like you're in a space where the earth meets the heavens. It's as if the gods themselves are watching. But constructing this dome wasn't easy. It was a challenge unlike anything the Romans had ever attempted. Building the walls of the rotunda was impressive enough, but creating a dome of this scale was groundbreaking. The Romans didn't have advanced mathematics to calculate static forces, yet they understood the basic physics of domes. They knew the dome's weight would push down and out. To counteract this, the lower third of the dome was embedded directly into the thick walls of the rotunda, acting like a giant anchor. They also layered concrete rings on top of the dome to combat the outward hoop stress. These rings acted like belts, preventing the structure from spreading outward under its own weight. Even the materials were carefully chosen. As the dome rose, its thickness tapered from 5.9 meters at the base to just 1.5 meters near the oculus. The Romans also mixed the concrete with progressively lighter materials, using volcanic soria, a porous stone that's so light it floats on water, for the uppermost sections. The result? A structure that was both strong and remarkably light for its size. Building the dome required ingenuity beyond materials. Scaffolding was essential to support the weight of the dome as it was being constructed. Imagine a massive wooden framework with trusses similar to those used in Roman bridge construction. This framework would have been carefully dismantled as the dome solidified. The Romans also used techniques like coffered panels, sunken squares carved into the dome's interior. These weren't just decorative, they reduced the dome's overall weight while maintaining its structural integrity. Combined with the oculus, these elements allowed the dome to remain stable for nearly 2,000 years. Once the rotunda and dome were complete, the focus shifted to the portico, the grand entrance to the Pantheon. This part of the building was more traditional, following the classic Greek style. It's octo design featuring eight towering columns at the front, with another eight just behind. The columns themselves are marvels of engineering. Made from Egyptian granite, they were quarried in Aswan, transported down the Nile, and then shipped across the Mediterranean to Rome. Each column is 40 Roman feet tall and carved from a single piece of stone, a feat that required precision and careful planning. However, the columns seem oddly short for the structure. Scholars believe the original design called for taller columns, about 50 Roman feet high. 
It's possible that these larger columns were lost at sea or repurposed for another project, forcing the builders to adjust the design. With the portico in place, the Romans turned to decoration. This was where the Pantheon truly came to life. Bronze trusses supported the portico's roof, and gilded bronze tiles adorned the dome. The pediment was decorated with a bronze eagle clutching a wreath, symbolic of Roman power and divine favor. Inside the rotunda was a spectacle of wealth and artistry. The walls were encrusted with exotic marbles from across the empire, ranging in color from deep reds to vibrant greens. These materials weren't just for show. They were a statement about the vast reach and resources of the Roman Empire. Colossal statues of Augustus and Agrippa likely flanked the entrance, while the niches inside the rotunda housed sculptures of gods and emperors. The dome's interior was patterned with 28 vertical rows of coffers, perhaps a nod to 28 being an Archimedean perfect number. Each coffer was originally decorated with rosettes of gilded bronze, turning the dome into a glittering artificial heaven. Over the centuries, the Pantheon has seen its share of changes. It's been looted, repurposed, and redecorated. Yet, remarkably, it remains largely intact, a testament to the skill and ingenuity of its builders. While other Roman monuments have crumbled, the Pantheon endures, offering us a direct connection to the past. Its influence is undeniable. Architects from the Renaissance to modern times have drawn inspiration from its design. The Pantheon didn't just change the way people thought about architecture, it redefined what was possible. Thank you for joining us, and if you enjoyed this dive into the wonders of ancient Rome, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on our next exploration. Have thoughts or theories about the Pantheon? Drop them in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll see you in the next one.